Okay, so then the book is overwhelming with names and I'm gonna highlight a few of them that are, you know, the big featured names. So don't think about um, memorizing them. And, you know, everything's gonna be take home. You're not gonna have to memorize stuff and say, oh, this. And because it's take home, I expect everybody to get 100%, right? So no more doing 15 minute quizzes and not getting 100%. I have them open for two hours because if you haven't done the reading and you haven't done the research, you have time to do the research during the quiz. I want you to succeed. And I want you to care about the information. I mean, uh, well, of course, if you don't care about the information, I can't make you do anything. But I am giving you every opportunity so that you can get a stunning grade and you can learn the material and then you can be, you know, hopefully marginally excited by the material. So that's all, that's all we hope for, right? Okie doke. Let's go to our site. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, let's see if I can do it from here. <laughs> I have not pulled it up behind my screen, and so okay. Wait a minute, Josephine. Oh, you can't have your camera. Okay, fine, fine, fine. You know, this, this thing, Josephine's just saying she can't have her camera or microphone on. She's just listening. This happens, this happens to everybody. Uh, a week ago, I, could, I was at costume storage, which is eight miles away from school. I was on a Zoom call. I had to do a meeting, no problem. And then uh, Tuesday, I'm trying to do a meeting, an important meeting about a production meeting. I can't even get on, I have to phone in. So then I'm on my cell phone, right? They can't even, nothing, you get a little cell phone thing. And then yesterday in my class, I couldn't get the sound on. I mean, it was so, we're not in an ideal situation. We're not in person. And hopefully we will, we can be in person at some point, but you know, we're just gonna muddle along and all, uh, all things give us grace and we will be, being accepting grace to ourselves, most of all. So that's what I think is the really the most important thing. Let's look at our page for today. It, I don't know, is this kind of helpful if we look at the page? So you guys can let me know if you think that's helpful. So this is our reading from Operetta to George M, except really we only get to 131 today. And we will catch up. I, I think we're a little, we're just running, trailing just a hair behind what I had done in our weekly outline. And so we'll take a look at that and I think we'll be able to kind of move forward a little more quickly. This is our overview. And then we will, um, we'll go to the lecture. And I realized what I did, actually I'll show you what I did yesterday for um, our previous one at the bottom, here we go. I'm, and I'm, you know, it's not having done this before and trying to kind of invent things as we go along. So you'll get the presentation and then when the recorded lecture is added, like from Tuesday, I'll put it here. So then when you see the, um, let me move this. When you see, open up your page, you get your, your um, icon of the book, your signed reading, and then you get the ZooTube, this <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> yeah, ZooTube, that's gonna be the next one, you guys, that is the newest hot thing. So this will be the, um, the class period on Zoom and then the PowerPoint outline and then all of the different things that we listen to, okay? With images, because you know what? We're in a visual medium, so I think we have to do that. And it, you know, there's some great stuff in here that you can take time and, go a little deeper in and we will be doing that. Oh, let me get to the next page because we will have um, some in-depth reports that you're gonna collaborate on and do together. So we'll talk about that. Um, hmm, let's talk about that next Tuesday and I'll make myself a note so that we can talk about how we're gonna do that. And we will, um, Oh man, where's my pen? Okay. Uh, 
These are gonna be presentations, our collaborative presentations that we'll do together. You'll be with, um, you'll be with another partner and we'll work out a way, there's a great way to do it on the discussion page where your group can really work, can create a PowerPoint, can put your images in and do everything right there. So if you haven't done it um, last, last summer when we did it, we even did it with um, video and everything. So it'll be really fun. And it'll be a way to get to know your pals in the group. So we're looking forward to that. Okay, so today, this is what we're gonna do. From Opera to Operetta, this is our PowerPoint. The lecture will go right here. So that's what I meant. I'm gonna try and follow a format and I'll try and reformat the other pages so they're kind of somewhat similar so that we can see them. You know, after you teach a class once, you kind of have it, maybe you get it a little bit more familiar with it. So we're just stumbling along. Today, we're gonna go from Operetta, Opera to Operetta. Opera, you know, we'll look at uh, briefly and then we'll do the Gilbert and Sullivan. We're gonna take a look at this great Gilbert and Sullivan overview by the Lampletters Musical Theater. It just gives us an entire capture for this 40 years in our history. And then we have an incredible image here of Victor Hubert here on the left, Irving Berlin and John Philip Suzu, who are gentlemen that really took us from the 19th century into the 20th century. And Irving Berlin, of course, is huge in the heyday of modern musicals. So it really will be in the, in the 30s, 40s. So he's a really, you may even remember, um, he wrote White Christmas. He wrote a lot of other songs that we have come in, in American popular music. John Philip Sousa, we're gonna take a listen to one of his pieces written in 1897, but a rendition from 2020. We're gonna take a look at some Victor Hubert, who's Herbert from this time period, uh, starting in the operettas and going clear into the present with influences by movies being made through the 1960s and before. So that's what we're gonna do. And let's take a look at our PowerPoint. And let's see if we can see it here. Let's see what we're getting. All righty. Uh, maybe I can do this so that we, do you prefer it full screen instead of looking at it like this or you don't care? You can chat, shout it out. I don't, tell me what you want. It doesn't matter to me either way. Yeah, okay, so, okay, we'll just look at it like this. And I don't know if things are, let me just see if I can move this over and I can make it a little bigger, right? So that should, that should work, oh, a little bit less. So everybody can see it. All right, so we're going from opera to operetta. So what does that mean actually? Let's, you remember we have this class wars basically in the United States and we started getting our first millionaires last time. So let's take a little look. Uh, opera, remember, imported from Europe. There's a lot of prestige behind it. It is costly. It is, um, has a lot of status. People who are wealthy go. It's the American aristocracy. So of course you're very sophisticated. There's that whole dress code thing. There's that, uh, um, you know, the highest form of musical theater. So there's those who have, those who have not, they're clearly not enjoying opera. Um, the New York Metropolitan Opera is founded by Mrs. Vanderbilt in 1883. And this is still there today. It has the golden horseshoe layout of boxes and tiers in a U shape that allowed society to see itself and be seen a shape that is maintained through many renovations and continues to the present. So what does that tell you about, uh, <laughs> what does that tell you about what, what kind of opera is supposed to be about? Is it about what's on stage or is it about what we are looking at when we see each other? And remember the boxes that we have from before were there, if you have a lot of money, you're actually on stage. So let's see, let, let me know if you go off of the, um, if you go off of the 
PowerPoint page if I do this. Are you off the PowerPoint page? Yes, yes. on Google. Okay, let's take a look at this. I want to just, I want to, I didn't do this and I should have done that. The Metropolitan Opera. So that you can see um, what it looks like inside. And it's called the Met. You can see here, right? It's just called the Met. And let's look at images of it. So you can see, look at this. Is this not, here is a spectacular view of the mat. And this is, they're talking about before the closure, which is, and they're talking about 2020 when we, they closed in March. So that's an amazing view of the opera. And I can stick that in, but, oh, dang it. That's not what I wanted. Here we go. So the lights are spectacular. The, see how the lighting is here so that really, look at how many faces you can actually see. Look where the orchestra is in the front of this. And the, um, oh, why can't we get rid of this? So you've got all of this kind of cool stuff. One, two, three, four tiers. Look at filled to the gills. I wonder if it says how many it holds actually in the full orchestra. I didn't even research that part, but we'll look at that later when we um, when we go to, oh, now I'm gonna be really confused here. Nope. Okay, so now we're back on our PowerPoint page, right? Yes. Um, I'm hoping for you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> So you see why it's called the golden horseshoe, that huge U shape, four tiers, everybody can see each other. When they turn the house lights on, you're really seeing everything. And you notice that most of those people in there look like old gray haired people in, in rich clothes. We should look up how much an opera ticket is now for the New York Metropolitan Opera. By the way, the New York Metropolitan Opera has locked out the union and they are, um, but there's such an old, this, right, 1883, it's such an old uh, opera house that they have to have special technicians to run the newly installed hydro hydraulics and stuff, but they've locked out Local One, and it's Local One because that is the very first union local in New York. So it's something that they have a, a theater manager right now that is Peter Gelb, and he is really draconian he does not care about the workers and he's caused a lot of problems and we'll see because i'm part of united scenic artists united scenic artists are the designers for all of live performance theater opera and throughout the united states and also in new york which is the new york surrounding metropolitan area united scenic artists um, represents designers in film so the United Scenic Artist has decided in solidarity with Local One that they won't cross a picket line. So we'll see what the opera is gonna do when they have to come back and they think they're gonna perform their new diversity musical um, opera in, they're hoping for September. We'll see how that works. We'll see, right? So let's go to Operetta. And what is Operetta? It really is Flourish these, no, no, man, I was so wrong. I said 40 years, but 70 years, shh, 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 shh. hey. And um, so for 70 years and the diminutive E-T-T-A means little. So the little opera with any names, many names actually, opera buffet, comic opera, operetta. In the early decades, it's in Paris, London and Vienna and later decades, Berlin, Budapest, and New York. And of course, you know, in 1860, we're still, the United States is still trying to find their way through vaudeville and burlesque, but um, we catch up. So the stories deal with courtly life and often opera was sort of elevated in their content with, you know, nobility and courtly life and kings and queens. And so operetta also takes on this kind of content but instead of focusing on tragedy or this romantic love story, it focuses on how badly they behaved. 
It has, of course, our sexually suggested tales and morality is seen as compromised. So I think that this is actually, when you even think about this idea of focusing on how badly they behaved, what does that tell you about this operatic form? What does that, does that give you a clue about what operetta might be like? Just shout it out. So if we think about in the United States, you know, current presidents, or if you, you know, George Bush was a huge uh, target for many comedians and not necessarily because of how badly he behaved, but because he had so many gaffes, like he would fall down and he would say funny words instead of what he intended. And then with Donald Trump, you know, there was a lot of um, poking at him with how badly he behaved, you know, on things like Saturday Night Live, on uh, these new, news, uh, almost real newscasts and that kind of thing. So when you're thinking about this idea of focusing on how badly they behaved, for someone who is elevated. And it, we don't really have kings and queens, so we, we pick on the president. But they're, they're poking fun at them. They're poking fun at this way of life. And it, that actually, for me, when it's focusing on how badly they behaved, it's not that they're, they're, they're trying to be mean, it's that they're just looking at it as funny. And they're looking at, at fictitious, very, very loosely based on real people. So it's not as pointed, it's not as mean spirited, and it is more in fun. The singers for the operetta have legitimate voices, meaning that they really can sing all the notes. They've got a wide range of skills, they're trained, and they have good breath control. They can fill a house without a microphone over an orchestra. And that's one of the big important features of opera too, is that the opera singers are not mic'd. You are hearing them live and they are able to project over a full orchestra. Operetta is not, in, not required to have such a big voice, but they do have a well-trained instrument and they have acting skills so they can portray these characters with some sort of depth. Again, their acting skills won't be what we expect because we're in such a hyper-realism era now because we have film, which gives us extreme close-up. So much of the film is spent on the actor's face, but their, their acting skills we may think of as broader, and more presentational style. Popular dances are um, incorporated, the waltz, the polka and the can-can. Wouldn't you just love to see some kind of can-can going on on stage? I think it's so fabulous. And actually we will take a look at an American in Paris, which does have a great can-can scene. That will be a little bit later. There is a live version of an American in Paris that we can look at. And uh, I had highlighted it on our site, but I'll, I didn't show it to you last time. So there's two conflicting aims happening in operetta. Richard Wagner's on one side, and you can see this is really through the mid 1800s. He thinks that operetta is a sacred undertaking, a progressive program transforming musical language and continuity into an artwork of the future. And then we have Jacques Offenbach, the composer director of Théâtre de Bouffe Parisienne, and Jean, you can correct my poor pronunciation. It's good, it's good. Oh, <laughs> you're yeah. so, so kind. Uh, so oh, anyway, I forgot the acoot over the, I have to work out my keyboard. I know <clears throat> I have a friend who's French speaking, and so I try to get the accent on her name correct. And then I immediately, somehow, I don't do it for a week or so, and then I forget how to work it on my keyboard, but there's a function, so I'll, I'll get better on that. Mm. But Jacques Offenbach is thinking the virtue of operetta is its brevity, its wit, its directness in a cultural industry. So thinking about that in terms of opera, which is not brief, it can be five acts. 
It can go on, even in contemporary opera, you're there for three hours. You can have two intermissions. It is sometimes, even the operas in English have subtitles. So, or, or super titles, you're reading them above the stage proscenium, they're projected onto the proscenium arch. Because now with our less literate um, audience, <laughs> shh, 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 shh. So hold on, my dog is seeing him. Just a second. Sorry, we'll come back to this. I'm Okay, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, you know, since nobody's in school, my neighbor has, he's young, like maybe 10 or 12, and they just have a new rescue dog. So he's taking him out on a walk and my dog's like, yes, you of course had to, you, he already had his walk this morning, but he's, he doesn't see why he can't go out there and play basketball with them. So anyway, let's go back to where we were. Pardon these, you know, we're home environment, uh, interruptions. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Um, this, so this thing about opera, which is this really elongated, sophisticated, and I think part of, part of the whole, uh, maybe both appeal and snobbery of opera is you get to have this extremely refined um, evening and you're there for a really long time. So you get to show off your fancy clothes for a longer time in front of a lot of other fancy and rich people. But you know this idea of the operetta is brief, it's direct, people can understand it, you know, so it's uh, it's it's more immediate and it's part of of who we are right now. And Offenbach is invited to the United States for the centennial celebrations of 1876. So that would be our 100 year anniversary. And that brings us to really the most well known operetta. Um, composers and lyricists, Gilbert and Sullivan. So in 1875, Richard Doyle Cart, and this, this is his last name, Doyle Cart, asks the dramatist, W.S. Gilbert, and the composer, Arthur Sullivan, to collaborate. So he actually brings these two guys together on a short comic opera to round out an evening's entertainment, Doyle Cart Productions. Doyle Cart, continues for a really long time from 1879 to 1982, so over a hundred years. And then again, 88 to 2003, when they are no longer funded by the um, British, whatever, Fine Arts Council. And then 2014 to 2016, they collaborate with uh, Scotland so that they can then perform a few other um, additional works that were all written by Gilbert and Sullivan during the time in which they lived. So we're gonna look at this really great beginner's guide to Gilbert and Sullivan by the Lamplighters Music Theater. And Gilbert, 1836 to 1911 and Arthur Sullivan, they're writing everything in the late 19th century, but it is still wildly popular till today. So let's take a look at that. And I think I can go right here, just a sec. Hmm, I might have to do it this way. Oh yeah, because I'm not on, right. If I was on two pages, that's why I actually did that before I remember now. So let me go here and we'll look at some Gilbert and Sullivan and this is pretty fun. Okay. And hold on a sec. I've put this, I have put this on your site. So let's just take a quick look at this. 
and you can look at it later. I'm trying to get you guys without getting onto this crazy thing. Here we go. <laughs> All righty. Enjoy what we have as a beginner's guide to Gilbert and Sullivan. Mr. Wolf, do you know Gilbert and Sullivan? No, sir. I have not had a chance to meet all the new crew members since I have been back. The composers, Wolf, from the 19th century. Oh, dear. What are the Americans going to say about us now? They just can't help themselves, can they? I'm the greatest captain of the Queen's Navy. Even if you've never heard their names before, you've probably heard or seen references to the works of Gilbert and Sullivan at some point in your life. Countless movies and television shows have either included their music directly, remixed songs with new lyrics, or simply referenced their existence. He never let it show, but he thinks you ought to know that he's proud of his boys in blue. Their works profoundly influenced how opera and theater were performed, and theater critic John Bush Jones considered them to be the primary progenitors of the 20th century American musical. The model of a modern major general, the venerated Virginian veteran who's been a wall so who were these guys and why was their work so influential? William S. Gilbert, a lyricist and comedic writer, and Sir Arthur Sullivan, a musical composer, lived in England during the reign of Queen Victoria and together created more than a dozen comedic English operas between 1871 and 1896. While they both could have enjoyed successful careers without the other and were doing so prior to their meeting, it was in collaboration that they achieved their greatest accomplishments. In 1875, theatrical manager Richard Doilycart brought Gilbert and Sullivan together to create Trial by Jury, an operetta for which Gilbert could draw upon his experiences as a lawyer. Following its success, they went on to create 12 more operas for Doilycart, all of which ran for hundreds of performances. Their shows were both hilariously silly and bitingly satirical, brutally mocking the many absurdities of Victorian era social norms, the legal system, and the British aristocracy. Essentially the 19th century equivalent of Saturday Night Live or The Simpsons in the form of an opera. The hallmarks of a GNS opera usually involved a couple whose love is complicated by social circumstance, mistaken or secret identities, at least one, sometimes a dozen, stuffy British aristocrats, occasionally fun occult elements like a magic potion or a ghostly curse. Always with your silly magical potions and lozenges, eh, Gilbert? Well, I didn't hear the audience complaining. A surprise twist of some kind, and ultimately a happy ending. Nearly all these elements are present in their earliest big success, HMS Pinafore. It premiered in 1878 and told the story of a lowly British sailor in love with his captain's daughter, who was well above his station and betrothed to the pompous and hilariously unqualified First Lord of the Admiralty. While their first three collaborations were all fairly popular in London, Pinafore, their fourth joint work, was an international sensation. Its first run lasted 571 performances, nearly unmatched at the time, and was so wildly popular that unauthorized copycat productions popped up all over the United Kingdom and the United States. And did we ever get paid for those? Of course not. To this day, more than 140 years after its opening, HMS Pinafore is still one of Gilbert and Sullivan's most widely performed operas, and it has been referenced or pastiched by other art forms countless times, along with their other two greatest successes, The Pirates of Penzance from 1879 and The Mikado from 1885. So what exactly made their work so different from any of their contemporaries? The quality of a Gilbert and Sullivan show stood above their peers in several ways. They exercised extremely tight control over nearly all aspects of production, from sets, costumes, and props, to the casting and performances of the actors. Gilbert personally stage-directed every member of the cast, 
demanding they learn their lines and staging exactly as he wanted them, which was highly unusual for the time. Perhaps I should have let them improvise more. Oh, Gilbert, you know as well as I do, they weren't funny. He also pioneered a more natural form of acting, which rejected campy self-consciousness, where the characters were unaware of how ridiculous they were. Contemporary critic Herman Klein wrote, We secretly marveled at the naturalness and ease with which the quips and absurdities were said and done. For until then, no living soul had seen upon the stage such weird, eccentric, yet intensely human beings. They conjured into existence a hitherto unknown comic world of sheer delight. Arthur Sullivan likewise closely dictated how each player of the orchestra would perform his music and insisted on personally conducting every opening night performance. As if anyone else could be trusted with something so important. Together they ensured that the quality of their productions was extremely high, which brought a level of polish to the English opera that eventually influenced theatrical performances in general the world over. And there was something uniquely special about the combination of Sir Arthur Sullivan's brilliant music with W.S. Gilbert's witty humorous libretti. Sir Henry Wood said in 1922, Sullivan's music is much more than the accompaniment of Gilbert's libretti, just as Gilbert's libretti are far more than words to Sullivan's music. We have two masters who are playing a concerto. This rare harmony of words and the music is what makes these operas entirely unique. We are the work not of a musician and his librettist, nor of a poet and one who sets his words to music, but of two geniuses. You hear that, Sully? He called us geniuses. Now if only he can convince our accountants. So all of that may have been very impressive in the Victorian age, but why are people still performing GNS operas more than 140 years after they were written? Well, Gilbert's particular style of social satire can easily appeal to any modern audience, provided that you do it right. There's a funny little paradox that arises when you stage an opera that's more than a century old. On the one hand, the original lyrics and dialogue unfortunately sometimes contained racist, sexist, or ageist tropes, and often referenced historic places or people or used words or phrases that a modern viewer may not even understand. On the other hand, the operas are so old that they're in the public domain, which means you can just change that stuff. This often gives production companies a chance to put their own creative spin on the work, or at the very least, update some lyrics with modern references that modern audiences can relate to, which in a very fitting way actually retains the spirit of the original satire more so than a production that exactly replicates the original. You can even completely replace the original lyrics and story with something totally different while retaining the same humor and style. The fast paced and intricately rhymed patter songs, which are many people's favorite aspect of the GNS canon, are particularly well suited to this. I am the very model of a modern U.S. president, a liberal one at first, but now it seems I have a center spent. And though my popularity is waned, I am not hesitant to say I've done quite well so far, although I lacked experience. Oh, how delightfully creative. Well, you would say that, but of course they haven't changed your music. And whether you perform it straight or completely remix it, a GNS show is always a blast for the singers. <laughs> There are so many things to love about Gilbert and Sullivan's work, from the clever patter songs and the powerfully emotional ballads to the jubilant finales, their operas have been bringing joy to audiences and performers for a century and a half. If you've never seen one of their shows, I urge you to give Gilbert and Sullivan a moment of your attention. You'll be glad you did. <laughs> No, sir, I have not had a chance to meet all the new crew members since I have been back. The composer's wolf from the 19th century. So I think that's a pretty fun little um, introduction to Gilbert and Sullivan. And if you haven't heard any Gilbert and Sullivan, they 
even, I mean, you know, like Linda Ronstadt and some other major performer did a movie, uh, The Pirates of Penzance in maybe the late 1980s. So over a hundred years after it was written and it has been mined and it is this wonderful combination of humor and wit. The, um, uh, the fact that it is in the public domain, and we talked about that last, last class period is, means that you can do it for free. So the music is out there, the lyrics are out there, you can feel free to change them, you don't have to pay royalties, and a royalty is in every single night performance. So that's kind of a really interesting and great thing about the um, Gilbert and Sullivan legacy. So let me go back to our, we'll go back to our um, class and we will look at where we can take up with, here we go. Any comments on Gilbert and Sullivan? How many of you have been to a Gilbert and Sullivan piece? Have you ever seen Gilbert and Sullivan in the live? Wait, am I, are you guys showing me or what are we doing? Are you raising your hand? Of course I've seen Gilbert and Sullivan. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, because you're from the United Kingdom. Very, very popular there, but also popular here in the US. Anybody else ever seen one? Serafina, good. What one did you see? Do you remember? May it, Serafina, were you responding to something else and I just caught your hand late? Okay, maybe she has her mic turned off now. Anyway, let's go, we'll finish up with Gilbert and Sullivan and take a look at our next possible event. So, um, this is, again, Gilbert and Sullivan. You can really look up any of them. This might be a great topic for our um, future collaborations. But Gilbert and Sullivan come to the United States. So that is very exciting. And, and I try to actually reference, I know America is North and South America, and I would like, I'll try and reference the United States mostly. But they have a huge influential beginning in the United States with HMS Spinafore, and that's one of the more popular pieces. Um, and you can see that now. The American premiere was in Boston in 1878. And as was referenced in our brief introduction, it spread like wildfire. It was in San Francisco, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and eight productions in New York City within one year. Imagine having that kind of popularity in the 1878 to 79 when you're traveling by train, you're taking everything with you, you there still is horse and buggy, there is no vehicle, there's no internet, there's no telephone, things are going by telegraph, and yet it can get that popular. I mean, it, it, imagine it is like, what kind of phenomenon would that be like <clears throat> in our current society right now? What kind of phenomena travels that quickly? What does that remind you of? Nobody. How about a film opening? You know, they, they will do a, when you can see a sneak peek film opening in one or two cities, and then they try to open it, they talk, they talk about how many screens they can open it on in major markets. So San Francisco, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Chicago, Seattle, New York, these are all major markets. How many screens can they open it on? And they talk about number of box office. So this idea of... Uh, when they're talking about the amount of money that something makes in a weekend, best weekend ever for a film. Imagine this happening over, you know, a hundred and let's see, what would that be? 78, about 150 years ago and happening that quickly, even in that time when you're traveling by train and you're not traveling by internet, <laughs> which we're doing right now. We're traveling by internet. 
So there's fun tunes. You saw that the playful spirit. There's uh, it's in English, so it doesn't need translation, and that makes it a very very fun thing for the public to see. It doesn't require any special um, language skills, and you can go see it. the The content is um, accessible. So Effie Ober, our first, we have a, a, one of our first female entrepreneurs puts together the Boston Ideal Opera Company, which is popular for over 25 years. And it launched with HMS Pinafore and has, con has continued success throughout its time period with non-English speaking operas as well. So that would be uh, even longevity after the, the um, debut. Operetta in America or the USA is starting to get um, very popular by the 90s. So let's see, we, we had it starting in 1860, right? So 30 years later, and of course, then 12 years after it comes to the US or 14 years, 1878, so 12 years later, we have four composers who are really taking on this new form. And one of the premier ones would be John Philip Sousa. He's born, educated, and musically trained in the United States. He is a premier military and concert band master. He's been with the US Marine Band, 1880-1892, the Sousa Band for another 40 years. It's American in spirit, jaunty rather than stately. And let's take a look at him. There's Mr. Souza. So in the younger days and in the older days, still maintaining this sort of military appearance. And he was, uh, as a band leader, you know, this, if you look at any band today and you're looking at the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of what they call that in a marching band. You guys, what's the name of the guy who leads the marching band? Any of my high school band guys, humans, men or women. It's not called a conductor. What is that called? Help me out here. A leader, a band leader? Yeah, but it's there's a certain name and I should know this because I have one. One of my sisters has five kids and each one of her kids was this at their high school. Drum major. Yes, thank you, Colby. And isn't that, isn't that an iconic drum major costume that, that John Philip Sousa is wearing right there? Every major band has adopted that kind of look of uh, this John Philip Sousa look. And whether it's the, I'll, we'll talk about that for just a quick sec. Whether it's this idea, this is called the Shaco hat, this shape with this big plume on the front. Sometimes it's a little taller and it's all, it originally was fur. And then the um, very festooned with multiple buttons. So this is a triple button front. Sometimes they're double button and you can see even these little flourishes are looking like the treble clef of the music score. A lot of chords and braiding because you know you're more important if you have a lot of more gold stuff on you. This epaulets, which formed, this epaulets started in the middle ages. So we're talking 12th to 14th century, we had epaulets. This is a uh, something that ties us into contemporary today. Fringe, contrasting cuffs, again, outlined with braid and then the ever present belt. He's holding a baton in his hand. And this is the, the um, Okay, what did you call it, Colby? I just already forgot it. Drum leader. Yeah, the drum major, drum major. Drum, yeah, drum major. Yeah, and they often carried a mace, which is a pole with a big, um, a big medallion or a big gem top or a crown or something that seems very important on the top. But think about this, for, for uh, over 150 years, we've had this drum major effect pretty much from John Philip Sousa. So let's, here, we're just gonna zoom through here so we can go down to John Philip Sousa. And we're gonna take a little listen of his 
music. So this is, let's see, you guys can let me know if you see this. Are you seeing the YouTube? Yeah. Yes. So 1897. Okay, we're gonna just, we're gonna pause on this image for just a second. Let me see if I can find a really good, well, let's look at him for a minute. And first of all, anything, did you, do you guys notice anything about this piece of music that we've talked about before that is reminiscent of things that we've talked about? I thought it reminded me of some kind of an overture or something. And sort of in my head, I pictured a parade for some reason. I don't know why. Well, it has become very common parade music. Absolutely. It's, that is really um, right on. You brought it right into the present with that. Totally parade music. Stars and Stripes Forever is also a very presidential thing in the United States. It's a common piece of music used. It's not as quite as, it's not all in the hail to the chief, but Stars and Stripes Forever is a very celebratory presidential music. Anybody else notice anything? Any response to just the sound first, and then we can talk also about the visual. 
I was about to say, it sounds like very American and very just proud. Right. And remember, this is our first truly American United States born, bred and trained composer. So this is what we've come to recognize as sort of a national sound and then popularized by many bands and national sound. Okay, anything else about that? Think about how it started, how it went through the middle and then what happened maybe at the end. It did the thing where it repeated over? It does, it did repeat phrasing over it, yes, absolutely. And then as it's repeating the phrasing, what did you notice about that as it's repeating? It's kind of getting louder. Okay, is it, so it's increasing in volume and how is it increasing in volume? Really good points. How did it increase in volume? This is gonna stretch your- It went to a more the, um, uh, I don't know, the string, the instruments the, where the ladies were playing. You know, the, those instruments made it louder. I mean, I had, it was so loud, I had to turn my hearing aids down. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yes, uh, okay, so anybody know the name of those instruments that the ladies were playing? By the way, it's not just a woman's instrument at all. You can see how work, how much work they were doing playing it. Is that a clarinet? Nope. Oboe. No. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget all my stuff. <laughs> I'm just asking, does anybody else, don't we have any band people here? Was it a flute? Piccolo. Oh, piccolo. Yeah, piccolo, it's like the tiny flute, right? But they, and flute is played sideways, it's longer. And then piccolo is smaller, but it gives us that very high melodic sound. And then, so it repeated the phrase and then what else happened? So you're right, Sue, it became louder. It was played with this surprisingly loud instrument, but very petite. And then what? Two things happened that, that both visual and volume wise. Let me know if you need a lifeline. Right the back, they stood up. Okay. Yes. I can't remember what they were playing, but they very observant. The women stood up too. The piccolo players mm -hmm. stood up first, right? So Colby says we increase in volume. Well, we increase in stature because the women stood up. And I shouldn't say that. I should say the musicians stood up to play the piccolo for that portion. And then Sue brought up that the ones in back stood up and what were they playing? Not you, Sue. You're monopolizing. You know everything. <laughs> yes, you do. You're very knowledgeable. Anybody else? Because I'm so excited. If this is new for you, this is tremendous information for you to have. Let's take a look at them for a second. No volunteers? Were they playing some sort of brass instruments? I'm not yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. They were playing trombones and trumpets. So really good point. So we get the volume increase, bump, 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 incremental from the whole group playing together, even though that's the whole group playing together. We're not hearing one voice of an instrument stick out. We get the elevation of sound and stature by having the instruments now they're louder. The piccolos are louder than everyone else and their performers are standing up. And then finally, we get the end of the piece with the big brass instruments, the tuba, the sousaphone, the, it's actually named after John Philip Sousa, the sousaphone, the trumpet, and the trombone standing with the bigger brass sound. Okay, and what does that remind you of that I talked to you about last time? It is a manipulation of the audience for a standing ovation. So I talked about it in reference to South Pacific, I talked about it in reference to what we were seeing, but your the audience's energy and excitement is increased and elevated as the volume increases, as the phrasing becomes more familiar. Remember uh, a big sitcom, we talked about sitcom, related to certain kinds of uh, performances last time, but a sitcom, in a sitcom, the, the writer's uh, mantra is you have to hit the joke three times before you really get the payoff, right? 
So that's the same way with musical phrasing. You want to hit the phrase at least three times before you get the payoff. So we have the introductory, we have the center phrasing with the piccolos and they're standing up. And then finally we get the big sound and the whole row stands up and notice it's right at the end of the music because then what? You know, they're, they're increasing the energy in the audience, both visually and orally. So this is, this is a really great instrument to use anytime you're creating a performance. John Philip Sousa was an exquisite composer for instrumental. Notice we don't have any vocals here. We're still, we're getting all this information even without the words. So now let's look at what we saw. Now, who's this guy? If he was in the beginning of the parade, as Casper said, he'd be called the drum major, but here he's called the conductor. But let's take a look at what he's wearing. How do we know he's more important? Because of all the medals. Because of all the medals. What? Well, okay, the medals. That's this strip right here. Each one of these tiny ribbons means a medal. And then each one of these is also a ribbon indicating a medal. So they're no greater or less than those. And the acute military eye would be able to tell you which each one of these is for. So what does that telling us right now? What kind of band is it? This is it a military band? Must be a military band. People, ordinary civilians can't go around wearing medals. It's kind of disrespectful, I would say. And so, also, um, I was gonna say that uh, he's wearing a different colored costume. Exactly. So now let's let's look or a uniform, little bit rather. more. Yeah. These guys, they're wearing a bright color, but he's wearing, what would you call that? Casper, he is wearing a different costume that's a different color, but what would you say about that? Um, I don't know. It's, okay, it's anybody. Simply, simply black, <laughs> I okay. don't know. <laughs> okay, black, what does black, what does black represent? Think about any kind of conductor you see. You know, in a contemporary musical, you would see someone wearing a tailcoat, which would be black. And then generally all the orchestra is in black as well. But here we have, more contrast between the black and the gold, much high, a much more high contrasted object. He has a lot more gold on his uniform, right? Notice even the gold buttons down the back of the uniform and the red trim. I mean, it's just is a really, really fine uniform. Again, the red trim is mirrored in the stripe on the pants and he's incredibly dignified completely erect with this really great, beautiful gold braid festooning all over his epaulets, his triple um, button detail and his gold cuffs. Very reminiscent of what we saw of Sousa, but the band is wearing the color that we saw in Sousa's picture, right? Let's take a look. There's one thing else I want you to notice. So here you can see his triple buttons. One, the closure is a, is a button closure, functioning button closure, and then the decorative buttons on both sides. And again, the, the beautiful brass um, rectangle buckle and the gold braid. Now, when this was in the 19th century, this was actual real gold threads, spun gold into the trim. And it, so it was a metallic, and when we get when we talk about metallic braid, we're actually talking about things where we're spun gold and silver. So were this to be an authentic garment, then it would be worth pretty a lot of money. Just a second, we'll look at something. So notice how every single nuanced note he's indicating two different things with his baton and with his left hand. Let's take a look at that. 
And this is common with every conductor. Both the baton is giving you one piece of information and the hand is giving you another piece of information. So let's take a look and see if you can figure out what it is. Okay, any ideas? What, you, what we just saw him do with the baton. Uh, let, me just, let me just pose this for you. Think of the baton as a counting metronome and the hand as indicating the phrasing. So which instrument is going to be coming in, how smoothly or melodically they're gonna play it, whether they're playing it in a legato, which would be sort of a slow, a consistent movement, a staccato, which is a very sharp and crisp movement, whether it actually opens in volume and he'll open his hand. So let's take a look at that. Remember the, the baton is metronomic. A metronome is the thing that goes ch -ch 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 and counts out time. When you're um, first learning music and you're learning musical notation, you would learn play to a metronome. So watch those two things. See the baton going up and down, counting one, two, three. He's going really clear with that. It, it is constant. And then the hand is indicating for the overall orchestra. So this is the row, trumpets, trombones, and where's the sousaphone? The sousaphone is a big bell instrument. And that's the one that's gonna stand up. So here we go, there's our phrase one. Second phrase. Okay, now, these guys are wearing medals and also sets of ribbons. So not quite as many as the conductor, he has a major set of ribbons. But this is telling me that it's a completely military-based orchestra, okay? Very military. This stand collar uh, is um, very, reminiscent of many band things. They have the white epaulets and they have red with black trim where he had black with gold trim, okay? So that's why his is a little more decorative and then they have cords of honor going around here. This guy has an extra cord around his sleeve. So you can see how that, the costume gives us a lot of information even when we're watching a band. And then there's one other thing I want you to think about when we, we're gonna speed up here. It's right now. What is something you notice here between these players and the other players? This cracks me up, frankly. The piccolo players are wearing dresses and the other, uh, the men are wearing trousers, but all the women are wearing these, these sort of modified uniform dress things. And you can even see it when they're sitting in the chair. So notice they're focused totally on the conductor. Let's see how their jacket is influenced by the ma male uniform. And then the skirted, is actually, the skirted effect is actually attached to the jacket. And we can see that going up the back. And there's the men's uniform wearing trousers. And then we'll come up to the big finish and we'll just look at that just a second when he's going to give us the moment right there. I wonder if we're going to see him right for. Okay, so watch him and then watch what the band does. Increasing in volume. And you can see a big movement. He has a big motion with both arms, and everyone is all in. And you know exactly where to look because they've elevated the sound. So it's not a musical comedy, but it is part of what was huge part of operetta written in 1897 and really truly American homegrown. 
So that's kind of a very fun and interesting part of the heritage that we have as the Americans. And let's go now, here we have Mr. Souza. Uh, you know, when you're young, you, look, doesn't this look like a lot of beards from today? We're in the same very hirsute, hairy period. And then we go into a shave period, but he still maintains the great mustache. And then we go to Victor Hub Herbert, who is a wonderful um, composer. Sousa composed primarily instrumental music and what, what we heard was without words and referred to Herbert as the best equipped man for his time for this work when speaking about writing librettos. So let's talk about writing librettos just for a quick second. And one of the things that is uh, a good kind of description of this is in your book, page 118 and talks about a playwright. This is story time now. A playwright given a story and characters has merely to arrange his story. Okay, hmm. That merely, that's kind of a tough call, I'd say. That's really tough. And develop it logically and naturally and establish certain climaxes which shall terminate his acts. So we've got the playwright dividing things into acts by story. A librettist must do that and much more. After constructing the play, must take all the pieces, find places for the songs, uh, write his songs, break up the play, and also in a real comic opera, carry on the action of his play to music and verse. He, was, he must plan the play musically and dramatically. So I'm speaking of really meritorious librettos. The average musical play written in America nowadays is beneath critical consideration. I've been guilty of aiding and abetting some of these conspiracies. So they're really a playwright is writing the words, but a librettist is writing the words, the story, and then has to separate it to come with the music. And then the composer writes the music for the songs and the songs now we're really integrating song and story. It's not just strung together by a theme. It's not just different acts being put one after another. So we're really seeing the whole piece come together as a unit. And George Herbert was one of the best of these. He's Irish born. German trained and a virtuoso cellist. He immigrated to the United States in 1886 when his wife was hired to sing at the Met, the Metropolitan Opera, which we saw before. And Herbert was hired to play in the orchestra and they stayed. He became a, he became a bandmaster. Uh, let me move that down. A bandmaster in the 22nd Regiment Band, the New York National Guard an orchestra leader, a composer for concert hall and silent films. So he's moving from orchestra to bandmaster to orchestra leader to composer for concert halls and even into the films. And this is really early days in the films. Silent films went up through about 1925. And but after that, we started getting talkies. And so we were into the talking motion pictures by the end of the 20s. So he moved into silent films very, very early on in filmmaking. He composed over 40 productions for the lyric stage, including Babes and Toylands, which had a sound film reconstruction in 1934 and 1961. I think the 30, no, I was gonna say is the 34 one um, with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, but I think that was later. Naughty Marietta in 1910, sound film reconstruction in 1935 with Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. And these two, Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy, were huge film musicals stars. If you had a Jeanette McDonald Nelson Eddy film, you had a hit. And again, Herbert, Victor Herbert is one that remained current for decades. He's considered to be the first great composer for the American musical theater. 
His finest efforts are for the comic opera. Even as the name changes in the 20th century, and it goes, this is when we start getting it called musical theater because we've had comic opera, we've had operetta and all of the other names. And now we're moving into this idea that it will be musical theater. Herbert changed course to write in a free and a frank American style as demanded by the musical taste of the American audience. Let me get rid of that. So he's responding to the audience. And this is something that the um, operetta is known for. And this goes into musical theater when it becomes a very popularized and contemporary to the time period in which it's written because it's responding to the American audience, which is a different kind of response than opera, which is opera had been around the, the even now in opera, they recreate operas even from the 19th century, the earliest 20th century. And they're, the, they're recreated in visuals, but the musical content remains the same. So this is really responding to an American audience. And here we have Mr. Herbert first playing his cello as a younger man and as an impresario, Victor Herbert. And let's go take a look at what we have for Mr. Herbert. He has Babes in Toyland. And we'll take a look at the first one and then the trailer for the 1960s uh, movie. So we'll bridge about 80 years. If I were a man like Captain that would you if you saw me sail in the Sorry, here, let's go this, do this. just I'm going to remind you, this is in English. And it, imagine how hard it is to understand. So we're going to play this last little thing, which is probably the most clear. And then we're going to talk about what you're seeing on the screen. So maybe we got upon our honeymoon. OK, 
Okay, so even though it's in English, it is very hard to understand. And then let's, we can look at these three guys, they're hilarious. Um, and just looking at the costume, we can tell something about these guys. Can, what are you guys seeing? What do you see? And I think about what we just saw in the John Philip Sousa and let's think about contrast. So we have one guy in black contrasted by these guys. And my guess is red and white, right? So we have one guy in black and we have two guys in red with white pants. And do they have like emblems, awards on them or something? On yeah, they have some kind of awards on them. We know these are probably phony, you know, um, but they are representing some sort of military feel, okay? Uh, let's look at their hats. Very, very exaggerated here and very close to the head. This guy is less than these guys. This guy's definitely, he's playing the dumb guy. He's playing the little bit of a clown. He even has something clowny on his face. And here's this guy questioning them, right? But they are more elevated in costume. Their costume's more complete. This is the shortness of these pants is intended for comic impact. And the elongated collar, this is a sailor collar. This guy has a more muted sailor collar. It's shorter, more in keeping with reality with his, this sailor stripe thing underneath is also just a, um, it's a symbolic kind of garment, but notice the buttons down the front, the waisted belt. And then this is, these are a 13 button front pant, which is typical for a very particular time period. The very wide bells, you know, we can think of, we used to call those elephant bells in the early, late 60s, early 70s. And then his bell is completely just on the bottom of underneath the knee breeches. They're wearing this essentially the same jacket, but with two treatments. He has a stripe. You can just see it very, very, uh, a little sliver of his stripe here. It's just that they're wearing a, it in a different way. His is completely open and this guy's is closed. He's also holding it closed. He has the much bigger collar. And then this guy, some sort of stripe effect, very tight leggings with comic white socks, the leggings ending far above. And then we see his little white lace up shoes. We see boots on this guy. We see this guy in a colonial from even an earlier century, the late 18th century with the buckle shoes. So the audience would catch all these details because they would be familiar to them. And they would know that this is then creating a comic, a comic moment. So how hard was that though, to understand the English? Very hard. And that's why even in English opera today, they have the super titles above the stage where they're going over the um, proscenium arch so that you can read. Sometimes they're on the side, but usually on the top so that no matter what language it's in, you can actually read it because it is so hard to understand. It's very unfamiliar to our ear. We don't have a, um, we don't have a good, we don't really have a really good um, ear for that kind of sound, that very quick note changing of the song and also of the, um, the language itself. It's a little bit elevated, but anyway, they were doing something and then going off on their honeymoon. So <laughs> you would get a lot of that too, I think, in the action and the motion of the piece. Let's look at the trailer for the 1960 version of Babes in Toyland. Very short. During backstage party, Walt Disney shared with you a few selected scenes from his first big musical motion picture, Babes in Toyland. Every sparkling moment, an exciting new entertainment treat. Starring Ray Bolger, Tommy Sands, and Annette, and Ed Wynn. 
Don't miss Babes in Toyland, coming at Christmas time to a theater near you. Okay, so this is, these are huge stars. And we're just going to talk about this for one quick sec. Tommy Sands and Annette okay, and Ed Wynn. There we go. So first you're going to get Ray Bolger. And Ray Bolger played the lion in The Wizard of Oz in 1939. So he's a huge star. Notice it's Disney now taking a musical from the 19th century and putting it on film. So we have from our musical stage to the film version already. So the first person is gonna be Ray Bolger, who has been a star since 1939. Starring Ray Bolger, Tommy Sands. So there's Tommy Sands, also a very uh, teen icon. And then this, She's so popular, she only needs one name, Annette. And that is Annette Funicello from, she was actually a Mouseketeer and then became part of the beach movies. And Annette and Ed Wynn. Don't miss Babes in Toyland, coming at Christmas time to a theater near you. Okay. So that's a fun little tidbit for um, Babes in Toyland. You might want to take a look at it. So again, it's a live action based on Victor Hubert's Babes in Toyland that we just heard the music. So you can see how they've changed it. And then we'll take a look at this IMDB so that you can just see the incredible rich history of this. And you get a, beer, a clearer picture, but here's the um, uh, cover for the poster of the movie, Babes in Toyland. And you can see it says Annette. They don't even need to say Funicello. So Cher wasn't the one that originated that at all. Annette's right up there with Cleopatra from the 50s. Annette was so popular, Tommy Sands. And then look at the great comedian trailer here. Let's see, are you guys seeing the trailer in a minute? Yes. Okay. Oh, I guess I'm off. Sometimes they don't let you not see the ad. Here we go. Do you realize these are the same gypsies we sold Tom to? <laughs> Shouldn't you be smiling, my dear? Okay, so some really fun uh, things about this um, piece. Good evening. So this is the famous Annette Funicello here um, with her very contemporary eyebrows and eyeliner, regardless of the fact that of whenever this piece is. And you notice that the dancing was very much reminiscent of the two teams that we had from West Side Story, which is exactly at the same time. This is 1960. And then look at the villain. To Barnaby, what are you doing here? And then check out this elongated, very exaggerated top hat, his painted on 
sideburns, will it really showing the pointy evilness of him? We know he's a villain. And besides that, he's wearing all black. I've come for you, my dear. How dare you come into my room? Tom, Tom! No need to scream. Your little Tom. There's a really good view of it. You can see they're completely uh, manufactured and pasted on. His eyebrows, you know, we talk about painted on Instagram eyebrows. Here they are right here. A little up curve to go with his up curve of his mustache, which the mustache seems to end and then is painted on to the skin right here. Uh, the purple lining for a little bit of flash. Tom is quite close by. And I do mean your very little Tom. <laughs> oh no, no. I will now at last have your hand in marriage. Never, never, never. May I remind you that just a little overdose of this- Stop, stop. I'll do anything you say. Of course you will. Come, my dear. <laughs> so a pretty fun uh, look at some crazy um, Disney-fied of something that was really written in the 19th century. So really a good idea of translating a musical stage very popular piece, Babes in Toyland, to the film version. All right, we've now made our very first transition from stage to film, and our, we should say stage to screen, and we're gonna take more looks at that kind of thing as we go along. Any questions, wrap up for today? In the very early time, uh, how many of you during the Gilbert and Sullivan, did you hear that the Hamilton reference, Gilbert and Sullivan? In that, uh, in our overview from Gilbert and Sullivan and Laplighter Cedar, when Hamilton, where they show the icon of the playbill for Hamilton, and then they actually rap about Gilbert and Sullivan, which is just a great, when things like that happen, that's called a quote. And it even can happen in music. So. Sometimes the music will reflect an earlier time period of music or a different kind of music, and it will be inserted right in the middle of a song, and that's called a musical quote. Same as if we were quoting something, like if we quote to be or not to be in Hamlet, we don't need to say we're making a quote from Hamlet. If we say the words to be or not to be, we know it's a quote from Hamlet. Musical quotes work the same way. They are familiar music or familiar phrases of music inserted into music for just a reference. And if you get the reference, it's good. You, you can feel like maybe you're on an inside joke. And if you don't get the reference, it doesn't really matter because it still is pertinent to the story. All right, we're almost to the end of our time. Any comments before we move on? You'll have reading assignments uh, that I'll give you. There's, uh, we have a quiz scheduled for next week. So it will be a 25 point quiz. I haven't decided if it's going to be multiple choice yet or short answer like before, but it will be the same kind of format. So I'll try and publish that over the weekend so that you have plenty of time to work on it. And I'll publish two reading for next week that will be based, the presentations will be based on. Any, any comments, last minute ideas, doing fun things over the weekend? No? You guys are I just so wanted to, uh, I just wanted to say um, the trailer we just saw it just it was so Disney like to me like it was <laughs> so funny and like the colors were so vivid and um, it was like a true Disney movie it was super fantastical and it was it was just funny to to you know hear that it was it was a Disney film so yeah and how early Disney got into making movie musicals based on other things so yeah, very Disneyfied, and it's interesting, 1960, here we are 70, 60 years later, and how if we looked at Aladdin, the most recent one that they've made, or I guess actually, what's the one that's coming out right now that's a little bit held up? Um, shoot. Cinderella? What, Cinderella? No, Cruella. Cruella, no, it's since then. I think Aladdin was actually after Cruella, but anyway, the. Um, 
you the that popular the brightness of the colors that moment when they put everybody in green light which is very unattractive so we know those guys are the villains you know it's very clear the contrast is very clear they don't like a lot of murky information and yet you'll find that i think disney writes both to children and to adult audiences but it's great to see that you know they're they're somewhat formulaic and that they've had this this idea in this plan for 60 years and it's working you know disneyland on the west coast opened in 1955 so this is really close after Disneyland, which is really bringing this idea of Disney to the public. And you can actually go in and really phys physically experience it in 3D as well as on film. Anything else before we wrap up? Because we're at our time. No comments. All right, well, thanks for joining me today. And uh, we're continuing on our music exploration of the development of musical theater. And I'm glad you came. Thank you. Thanks, Thank have you. a good weekend. Thank you.